This is the sixth and final installment of this video series. Getting to this point has kind of been a journey, and I want to recap everything I've done so far. The aspirin was first extracted, then it was hydrolyzed, decarboxylated, nitrated, and reduced. This left me with a molecule called P-aminophenol, which needs to be acetylated to form the final paracetamol. So in terms of chemicals, there isn't much that I need. On the right, I have the P-aminophenol from the previous video, and on the left, I have some acetic anhydride. Acetic anhydride is commonly used to make illegal drugs, so its sale is pretty heavily controlled. At least in North America though, you can get a small amount from eBay, but it comes at a pretty hefty price. The procedure that I'm using for this video was found online, and I'll provide a link to it in the description. To start things off, all of the P-aminophenol was added to a flask, along with a little bit of water. P-aminophenol is not very soluble in water, and what we want here is an evenly mixed suspension. Once I felt like I had a nice, even suspension, I added the acetic anhydride. After it's added, the P-aminophenol should quickly dissolve. I found that the stir bar wasn't doing a great job at mixing things, so I decided to do it manually. The procedure that I was following said it would take about 2 minutes for a precipitate to form, but in my case, it took about 5. In this reaction, the P-aminophenol is being acetylated to form our final paracetamol. This type of reaction is known as an acetylation, and in the final product we form an amide bond, which I've marked in red. In terms of the mechanism, the first step is the attack of the carbonyl by the primary amine. The reason this occurs is because the nitrogen has a free electron lone pair that can attack the partial positive of the carbonyl. This leads to the formation of this intermediate molecule and a new carbon-nitrogen bond. The proton from the nitrogen is then intermolecularly transferred to the oxygen. Electrons on the negatively charged oxygen then move to reform the carbonyl. A carbon-oxygen bond is broken, which leads to the formation of the final paracetamol, as well as a molecule of acetic acid. So coming back to the preparation, it took about 5 minutes for some solid to start forming. The solid that's precipitating out is our desired paracetamol, and as I continue to mix it, it seems like more appears. It's then mixed for the next 15 minutes or so to make sure that the reaction goes to completion. So 15 minutes later, the reaction should be more or less done, and I move on to filtering. I turned on the vacuum to pull away the brown liquid, and I washed the flask out a few times with cold water. The water helps get out any paracetamol that remained in the flask, and it also washes the stuff that's already in the filter. It should help wash away contaminants, side products, and unreacted starting material. With that being said, paracetamol is slightly soluble in water, so a minimal amount should be used here. So once I was done with the washing steps, I used a metal spatula to scrape off the product. I keep the vacuum on to dry it up as much as possible, and I'm eventually left with a powder that looks a lot like the P-aminophenol that I started with. Pure paracetamol is white or colorless, so what we have here must be pretty dirty. Luckily, it should be pretty easy to clean this up, and I just need to recrystallize it from water. The dirty paracetamol is placed back into the small flask, and I add a little bit of activated charcoal. Activated charcoal is very good at getting out colored impurities, so it should help us get rid of this brown color. I then added a somewhat arbitrary amount of water, mixed things around, and turned on the heating. I also quickly made a hot filtration setup, because the activated charcoal needs to be filtered off. I let the solution boil for about 30 seconds, and then I filtered it off. It might be hard to see, but the liquid coming through is nearly colorless, so it's looking good so far. Once everything had filtered through, I washed the flask with a little bit of water. I waited for everything to pass through the filter, and then I boiled things down a little bit to get it more concentrated. 
I did a time lapse, and as it cools, we can see the crystals forming. The crystals are unfortunately still brown, but on a positive note, they're a lot cleaner than before. Once it had cooled to room temperature, I put it in the fridge to fully crystallize. After about an hour in the fridge, I think I precipitated as much of the paracetamol as possible. The crystals were then isolated by vacuum filtration, and I washed them a few times with ice cold water. I kept the vacuum going to dry them up, and using a metal spatula, I scraped them off the filter. The crystals were transferred to a filter paper, and although they're not super brown here, they're still evidently discolored. When I tested the melting point, it was way off from the theoretical, so I did another recrystallization. After the second recrystallization, the melting point was much closer to the theoretical, but it was still discolored. So to purify it even further, I carried out a third recrystallization. After the third one, I was left with a very clean product. I tested the melting point, and this time, it was pretty much exactly the theoretical. A very nice friend of mine then ran a hydrogen NMR on the product. So from the data in the graph and from the melting point, I can confirm that I do have paracetamol. The NMR here is also quite clean, so the product I have is probably pretty pure. I am only detecting hydrogens here though, and it's not going to pick up inorganic things like metals. At some point during the preparation, I used palladium on carbon, so it's possible for the final product to contain some palladium, but it's not going to show up here. With that being said, I'm going to go over this NMR and NMR in general in more detail, but I'm going to do that in a separate video. So in the end, the yield was 0.21 grams, which represents a killer percent yield of 18%. The major reason for the low yield is because I did multiple recrystallizations. Each recrystallization gave a more pure product, but I lost quite a bit in each one. It's very normal to lose some product when you recrystallize, but I think I lost a little bit more than I should have because I used way too much water. To get the efficiency of the series, I multiply out the individual efficiency of each reaction to get an overall percentage of 0.26%. So with this amazing method, I was able to convert about 100 extra strength aspirin tablets to one regular strength paracetamol. In the end though, this was mostly just for fun and to explore the chemistry. I never really expected to get a great yield. An inherent problem with synthetic pathways like this is that the yield is sequentially whittled down with each step that you have. No matter how efficient your steps are, unless they're 100% efficient, you're going to lose something with each one. Even if I got an 80% yield for every single step, my final percent yield would only be 26%. This is just one reason among many why when you're synthesizing something, you want to use the fewest steps possible. Anyway, I guess that's all I have to say about this reaction. This was the first real series that I've done on this channel, and it's been pretty well received, so I think I'll do another one. At this moment, besides Nile Red, I don't have any particular ideas in mind, so if you have any, please leave them in the comments. Alongside this video, or shortly after, I'm going to upload the NMR video that I mentioned earlier. I decided to separate it off into its own video, because I thought it might be nice to do a little introduction into NMR. I'm going to do my best to not make it too technical, because I want everyone to be able to follow along. The next video that I'll be posting is the Canizaro reaction of benzaldehyde. What I do want you guys to do though, is vote for the next video that you want me to film. I have a decently large list at the end of the video, so please take a look at it and let me know in the comments. As usual, I'd like to thank everyone who's supporting me on Patreon. Anyone who supports me with $5 or more will get their name at the end of the video like you see here. If I made a mistake with your name or I forgot to include you here, please let me know by messaging me on Patreon. Also, if you haven't already, you can subscribe to keep up to date with every video that I post. I currently release one video a week, but I'm going to try to release more.